Um, so the title of this uh, presentation is Lessons um, from Nonprofit Journalism. But first, before we get to that, we'll do lessons from uh, a biography for you. That was um, written for, the, for when I was a Knight Fellow here at Stanford. Um, and it's an incredibly poor representation of my career. I was not inspired by Thornton Wilder. Um, <laughs> But somebody wrote it, and I thought, no big deal. It's just going to be hidden on this website. And here it is, like two years later, coming back to haunt me still. So uh, first big lesson, not on the slides. If anybody ever writes a bio about you that you don't like, deal with it right away, uh, um, because the internet will surface those things um, for quite a long time. But um, like Ann said, um, I spent um, a decent amount of uh, time in Costa Rica. I had started as a sort of a traditional newspaper reporter um, right out of college in 2001. Um, and had sort of the traditional newspaper upbringing. Uh, but I'd left um, San Diego and moved to Central America, sort of looking for a little bit of an, an adventure, and, and also was quite unhappy with uh, kind of what the professional landscape was like um, for me uh, in, in journalism in San Diego. And so while I was down there, I was working on a story with the LA Times, and um, I, there was a whole presidential corruption problem there. And I was meeting with um, one of their reporters in a bar, um, and having a beer with him, and he was, he said, um, you know, he was talking to me about what I wanted to do with my career, and I was saying I wanted to move back to San Diego um, and do investigative reporting, and he'd spent a good deal of his career in, journal in San Diego before going down to Latin America, and he said, um, well, if you want to do investigative reporting, um, you won't be going to San Diego. And I said to him, well, you never know, maybe there'll be a group of rich, smart, old people that'll put up a bunch of money to start a new publication. Um, and he uh, proceeded to laugh at me the way that a, a more veteran reporter laughs at a really young reporter. Um, uh, two weeks later, I got an email from a group of uh, rich, smart, old people uh, that were putting together a new publication in San Diego. Um, and that is eventually what uh, we started, became Voice of San Diego. And I tell you that story just because um, really the, um, the idea that it would uh, that you'd start a new publication. Back then, this was 10 years ago, 2004. Um, the idea that you'd start a new publication was actually laughable. Um, and you fast forward to 10 years uh, later, and not only is it not laughable, it's what's happening what, every single day across journalism and across all sorts of different, um, all kinds of different journalism publications are popping up. So um, the landscape has, sh has shifted uh, quite a bit since, um, since we were doing that 10 years ago. And there's something really, there was something really specific about that time, I think, that's really instructive um, first before we kind of dive in, and that is that um, you had all these, um, you had a sort of trend of consolidation um, across uh, newspapers in big cities in America. So you had monopolies, right? You had, in San Diego, in the early 90s, you had three major newspapers battling with each other every day in competition. You had a, um, an, a morning paper, in the Union, you had an Evening Tribune, and then you had the LA Times had a full San Diego edition. So you had all sorts of great, crazy competition, great journalism going on because those organizations were constantly battling with each other. Um, in a course of a few months, you had the LA Times leave town, and then the two newspapers consolidated, and very quickly you just had one monopoly. People had one, basically one choice um, for a newspaper. And for a long time, uh, there was a whole sentiment of unhappiness with people in, um, in San Diego with the job that that one newspaper was doing. Because you get a monopoly, it's very easy to get lazy, to get arrogant. You're the only show in town. Um, but for, uh, you know, so from the mid-90s, though, or the early 90s through the mid-2000s, early 2000s, people really had no recourse. A bunch of the people that helped start Voice of San Diego had been trying to start, uh, trying to think about how to start a new newspaper. But every time they dug into it, it was just way too expensive. I mean, you had to spend, you know, more than half of your money on the printing press and on the, the actual paper and on the trucks to deliver it. And so it was just prohibitively too expensive. But what happened was you had sort of the angst and unhappiness that people had in that monopoly rising um, at the same time that the barriers to entry in journalism were going down rapidly. And in the, you know, in the fall of 2004, when we really got going, finally you could see a way that you could start a new publication um, online and reach uh, larger audiences, but you could do it for just really like a fraction, a fraction of the cost. Basically, newspapers were spending at that time about um, three quarters of their budgets on the actual production 
of the newspaper, like the actual physical production, and then the rest of the quarters, the newsroom, and everybody like that. We go, you know, we as a nonprofit and going just online only were able to spend about 80% of our money on actual journalists. So the margins were just uh, flipped that way, and I think really sort of, uh, you know, and that's what you're seeing, excuse me, to this day is just that now the money can actually be spent on the journalism and not on all sort of that hard production. So just want to go through some basic like lessons that I learned and things like that, and then we can just kind of get into some conversation. Um, the first one is start is start small. Um, uh, there's a great saying, and I can't even remember who said it, but somebody something they go something like this: like, don't try to do something on everything, but do everything on something. Um, and that's what you're seeing with all kinds of different startups right now: is just uh, starting small and being a niche publication. What is it that you can do better than anybody else? Um, each one of you has a fascination or an expertise in something. Um, what is it that you can follow in your passion that you could be the person or the expert on um, and really carve out a niche? For us, it was um, let's do investigative reporting on San Diego politics. That was the one thing that we wanted to do really, really well. And then from there, you can grow. We built up an audience, and then we could move on to other things. But it was really that idea that was really starting small, um, when you start up a new publication, you're going to get, you get tons of story ideas um, and you have a small staff and you have to make a ton of decisions about what you say yes and no to. And so as soon as you define, you put a stake in the ground, this is what we do and this is who we are, then you can um, really establish yourself and then kind of slowly grow and move on. Um, this is something that's happening in a lot of different publications right now. There's a great one called Syria Deeply. I don't know if you've heard about that, but they focus just on the Syrian war. A small, you know, it's a small group, and they've got ideas. They now they're going to move. They've perfected that model, and they're going to move on and go, cover um, resources exploration in the Arctic. Right, totally unrelated, but another fascinating topic that they've just perfected the model on one thing, and then they're moving it um, to the next because you learn tons of lessons from just starting really small. Um, and there's a great, uh, I don't know if any of you read the, there's a great blog by um, Jay Rosen, who's a professor at NYU called Press Think, but he's got a great post in the last couple weeks on this, on the starting small and starting a niche um, publication about what that can teach sort of young journalists and young entrepreneurs. Um, the second thing is to make friends. Uh, when we started, um, I think my mom was the only reader. Um, you know, I mean, we really had to start by one by one by one to amass a readership. Um, but there are tons of places out there that have absolutely huge audiences that are cutting back on their budgets, and they're desperately looking for people to be experts on something and for people to feed them stories. And so uh, making friends and making partnerships is an incredibly important part of starting something like this. Um, for us, we, uh, we created a partnership with NBC um, really, really early uh, that was incredibly important because, like I said, we had such a small audience. We had really good stuff, but it was sort of like creating this really great product and leaving it on the curb and hoping, he, hoping somebody like wandered upon it and left their money down next to it. But with NBC, they had like, you know, almost 100,000 people every night and they had just laid off a bunch of people and they needed somebody to come on and to give them stories. And so it worked really, really well. Um, a lot of times with those friends, my, uh, my advice for people is that it's a lot better if you try to find an organization that you don't that you don't have the same strengths. It's really natural to think like, oh, these people do the same thing as us. We should be partners. We should be friends. But really, if you both do the same thing, you don't have a whole lot to offer to the other person. So I would say look for people that are actually quite opposite to you, but some, they don't do what you do, and, and you, they have something that you don't have at all. Um, and eventually, so that, so that gets you up to like bigger audiences and everything like that, but eventually those places all have money and if they become reliable, if they rely on you enough, you can eventually come to them someday and say, we need some money now for what we're doing. Um, that's what we would end up doing is offering our stuff for free for a while, um, a little bit like a drug dealer until people got addicted to it. And then once they were addicted to it, we were like, all right, it's time to pay or we're going away. Um, the other one is do is do, do everything, like you have to be prepared to pretty much do everything. Like, um, I was never in my life dreamed in journalism I was gonna spend so much time on HR or figuring out how many hours of vacation somebody had. Uh, it's not glamorous, it's, you know, it's not exciting. We, uh, when we moved offices to save money, um, uh, the top, us, the top two executives at the place, um, moved all the furniture one weekend. Um, and 
uh, probably have uh, a few like really serious back problems still to this day because of it. But you know, you just kind of have to be, you end up being scrappy. You don't have the huge infrastructure. And you start to realize that if we paid $10,000 for movers, we could, you know, for $10,000, we could hire freelancers for like two months to do amazing stories, right? So you kind of weigh all those sort of things. And you just have to be prepared. I think that's the one thing that a lot of people who jump into it right away, they think, I'm just going to be able to go do this because I can go do the journalism I want to do. Really, you're going to try to set something up so other people can do the journalism that you want to do, and you're going to end up doing a lot of other things that are equally rewarding and interesting. They're just not exactly what you might have thought when you jump into it. Um, the other one is decisions. There's, a, there's obviously a ton of decisions, but I want to focus on two of them. Um, one is technology. You know, you really, um, uh, I think you really have to decide at the start, are we just a media company or are we a media and technology company? And I don't think there's a right or wrong one of those, but it's just a really important decision to make. Because um, me, I'd probably choose just a media company and then plug into whatever kind of existing technology people are doing and uh, try to just use whatever free or, or very low cost services there are and just focus on what I think I can do best. But there's plenty of other places that um, make technology a really important part of what they do and they hire those people on staff and they're building their own content management systems and building their own websites from scratch and doing all kinds of you know, apps and, and all those interactives and all, all the kind of things like that. It's not, like I said, there's not one that's right or wrong. It's just, you know, what, what, are, you, what are you good at? What are you interested in doing? And what do you want to focus on? The other one for us was, um, was fundraising. So there's a lot of different ways that nonprofits do it. Um, what we decided to do was um, basically uh, just focus on building up readers, users, and just focus on the journalism for the first couple of years instead of trying to uh, do the journalism and the fundraising at the same time. We were lucky that we had some seed money that we could get going. But um, it, it's a, if setting up a whole fundraising uh, apparatus is an incredibly huge um, undertaking, and if you don't have a product or name recognition to try to sell to try to sell to raise money off of right away, that's really hard. So we just tried to build up the users and then figure out the financial stuff down the road. Um, now there's plenty of newer places. I think you guys learned about the Texas Tribune. They had a lot of money to start off with, and their whole thing was figuring out the business model right from the start. So they brought in like all the big name people to come help them, and they're head and shoulders above everybody else in fundraising, and they're the ones who are really figuring out the business model. A lot of that, again, is what your expertise is, maybe what your passion is, and kind of how much money you have. Um, so just a real quick, um, real quick overview. So VOSD, Voice of San Diego, was where I was, CIR, where I am now. But if you t think about that niche, like what is your niche? Um, and starting small with voice, it was San Diego politics and civic affairs. We're going to do that absolutely better than anybody else. We're not going to worry about food. We're not going to worry about entertainment. We're not going to worry about the Chargers or the Padres or anything like that. This is what we do. And if you're interested in this, you'll come to us. And if you're not, then you know, there's plenty of other places to go for what you're interested in. Um, with CIR, it's deep investigative reporting um, across all platforms. It's not quite as it's not quite as focused as sort of the topic area, but it's a special expertise. Is what we do is investigative reporting. Um, I get all kinds of really great, interesting story ideas on my desk every day, but they're not necessarily investigative. They might be explanatory. They might be feature or whatever. And so because we have the, that box around what we do, it's just a lot easier to say no to those ideas, even though I want to read them and I think they're interesting. It's just that that's what our identity is. Um, voice is, was web, is web first. Um, so first, the first and foremost, run our website, get an on online publication, and then figure out all these other partners. Um, CIR is built around partnering first. So we, our website is you know, not a really big, important part of what we do. But what, what is important is trying to do our stories and then get them out in front of places that have big audiences. So that's on Frontline or on Medium or on the, in The Guardian or places like that. Um, and then the, um, the, for the financial part, people always want to know where the money comes from. Um, this is sort of like a newer trend. There's a lot more nonprofit organizations around, um, but it is not like a totally new phenomenon. Public broadcasting has been doing it forever. Um, KQED in here in the Bay Area has been doing it forever. Um, but mostly it's 
um, found foundations like places like the Knight Foundation, large community foundations, things like that, family foundations, um, major donors, just people who uh, are uh, incredibly wealthy and want to give their money away. Um, uh, memberships, so this is like the equivalent of when you have the public radio, you know, when KQED will just, instead of playing all your favorite programs, will just be fundraising for a week, right? So that's just individual members. That's hoping each one of you will pay, you know, five bucks a month over the course of the year um, to contribute. Um, and then events are a huge part of that. Um, so doing all kinds of, this is sort of like one of the areas where there's, I think, a lot of like interesting experimentation and innovation going on right now. In the, in the space is just figuring out what kind of events people, you know, people will go to and will actually pay for. It, you know, what everybody's kind of finding out is that in this very digital world where everybody's consuming all this stuff and there's their face down in all their screens, they're actually really yearning for something in person after all that, some sort of way that they can connect with people or meet people um, in person. So um, we're doing a lot of different things around, you know, after a story pops, then doing a big event. We're working with um, playwrights right now um, from the communities that we cover when we do a big story for them to do um, plays on them and then we you know and then we'll actually host theater and have people come um, to those events so I think that anybody have any questions on that kind of stuff or? all right so a few things uh, just like big picture takeaways for the the fun the fun things um, is that room for experimentation. Like when you're, with, with all these sort of nonprofits, you don't have, um, and back to the financial thing, first of all, you don't have to make a profit to go in somebody else's pocket, right? So everything you're raising, all the money you're raising is just trying to go to actually, uh, you know, make the organization survive. Um, but you also don't have like old legacy organizations where you have w strict ways of doing things. So there's a real like premium on experimentation. Um, you can wake up, we wake up in the morning, think of a new idea, try it out. If it doesn't work, um, we scrap it and pretend it never happened. Um, if it worked, then we'll go and keep doing it. Um, it's a really, I think it's just a really fun, uh, fun place to be in right now. Um, because a lot of the times, too, the organization, these kind of nonprofit organizations are getting grants from different, different uh, foundations to actually, like, try out totally different new things. So there's actually a financial incentive for the experimentation. Um, the other one is premium on impact because it is nonprofit. Um, when you go to your board of directors meetings, they don't say how much money did you make, but what they do say is what have, what have you done, and not even just like in a you can't really do it in like a warm fuzzy way like oh we increased conversation around these topics right like that was always a fun way of of not actually saying you actually did anything. Um, so they want to see they want to see stuff happen because of the stories that you do. And honestly, I mean, I think that's why, all, like, you know, investigative reporters get in the field is because they want to make a difference. And so this is a financial model that's a lot more directly, um, I think, in line with a lot of the motivations that people get into the field for, which is actually seeing change. So um, it creates all kinds of other interesting um, questions around advocacy and around being ob objective and things like that. Um, but it's really satisfying to see that's the way we're measured is actually how much change do we bring about. Um, and just building, you know, being able to build something yourself. Um, like I said, when I started my career, not, you know, not all that long ago, 15 years ago, that was not even anything that you thought about. It was just, I hope, hope to glom on to a really large company that can employ me for my career. Um, and, you know, these sort of places are popping up all over the place all the time now, and it gives you the opportunity to sort of build something um, and, and make the rules that you want in journalism. I was always really frustrated by a lot of the stupid rules that I saw in journalism. So this allows us to sort of throw out the stupid ones, keep the good ones, and make up um, other new ones. So the hard part. Um, there's no mountaintop. So for the longest time, I kept thinking, if we keep pushing and keep working hard, we're going to get to this point, right, where everything will just be fine, and the money will just kind of flow, and it'll be nice and easy. Um, and the fact is that it's, there is no, there's never that point. There's not like a, in a private company or a startup where eventually you sell or you go public and you make your money and you've sort of reached some pinnacle. Um, with the nonprofit model, it's just always kind of a marathon sprint up a hill nonstop and you're always hustling to try to make the budget that year. There's never any sort of magical, beautiful land that you reach when everything's great. 
Um, the only time that happens is if you just quit and take a fellowship at Stanford for you. Um, and the other, quite, the other thing is a lot of people think it's like more holy, right? Like it's a nonprofit. It's not, there's, there's not like, it's not driven by profits. And so it must be like, it's just a lot more clean and, 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 and holy, but it's not. I mean, anytime there's money attached to anything, there's always all kinds of agendas. There's always uh, all kinds of uh, power at stake, and there's always people who really want to see certain things happen. Now, they may not want to see them happen just because of their own financial bottom line. They may want to see them because of their own agenda, but that's not really any different. Um, everybody's carrying these sort of agendas, so you really need to balance those, and they can be a little bit more like insidious and, and hidden than they would be if it was just like a for-profit, where it was very clear what everybody's motivations were. Um, and the other one is, is it scalable? If you look at a lot of the places that we're talking about, like Texas Tribune or ProPublica, CIR, Voice, you know, they've been around now for a little while, and there's been some growth, but it's not outrageous growth, and um, there's not all these sort of places popping up in every city across the country. So I think that's kind of one of the big questions it faces now in the future is, are these organizations kind of what they're going to be? And is that it? And are, is, is, are we started to hit a plateau? And so um, the best part, like I kind of alluded to before, was just the ability to make your own rules. Like um, you, you get to not have to live by somebody else's rules. As journalists, we are really good at grumbling about management. Like I don't think there's a class of human beings that's better about grumbling about management. Uh, either their own management or the management of people uh, who run places that they cover. And so once you get in this sort of position, you can't just grumble about management because you end up being in management. Um, but that also gives you an incredible amount of leeway then to start doing things the way that you thought they should be done um, when you were grumbling about management. So um, that's the end of my spiel. So I'm happy to take, uh, happy to take any questions. Yeah, um, so the, I think the, being a journalist, it was just sort of very easy to have your head down, focus on what you're doing, and, not, and sort of like uh, sort of block out all the noise and just kind of do your job and do it day after day after day and just keep focused on that. And I think when you, as an entrepreneur, you, are, you can't put your head down. Like, your head's always up, and it's got to go in, like, a million different directions. And I sort of, sort of uh, equated it with almost like running for mayor. It was like uh, you running around to a million different places every day and trying to do, like, a million different little things. It was like, go speak to this group. Go, I got to go do this, and then I got to worry about this and think about this. And it was just, I think my attention span is, was fragmented in about a, a thousand different ways rather than just sort of one easy, simple little goal. Um, but then you get to see, like, the, the, actually the impact of what you do, I think, is a lot more amplified. Instead of just one story at a time being one person, you're able to, like, you're able to impact the whole organization that can then move forward towards uh, one goal. So I think a lot less sleep, a lot more headaches, but then I think in the end, like, a lot more satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I think um, ooh, that is a really good question. Um, I think the ability um, to try to always be looking at like the big picture of things, like when you're doing a story, like you got to get into the minutia and you got to you, know, you got to be interviewing people and get into the details. But then eventually, if you're going to do a good story, you kind of have to step back and look at everything in the big picture. Um, I think just um, interviewing people, like you have to be a really good listener. Um, I think you have to be really, uh, really organized. But I think, I think probably most important is just being um, willing to like take a risk, put yourself out there, and then being like dogged and determined about something. Like as a journalist, you can't, like if you're working on a deadline story, like you can't take no for an answer from the source, right? And then, so maybe in the other way, it's like, I can't take no for an answer on this grant. So I'm just going to be a total pain in the ass. 
and I'm going to be okay with that because it's in service of, of something larger. And I think alternatively, I think I'm actually a lot better, I think it's more of an impact of, a, I'm a lot better journalist now because I think I'm able to see the world in a wider, I think it's able to see the world a little bit differently. And also, like, I've been, now been the subject of news coverage, which totally changes your uh, opinion about reporters. <laughs> <laughs> Strategy, but at the same time, it has a really good website compared to most of the publications. I would say, in my personal opinion, better. It's than CIR. Yeah, I think it's a better website than the <laughs> of San Diego. Huh. At the same time, we saw that the tech budget for CIR online is quite high. So these things don't. I mean, like together, they don't seem to make sense to me. Could you tell us a little bit hmm. about that? Well, I will say that nobody at CIR likes our website, mm -hmm. so. I will let them know there is one human being on the earth that likes it. Yeah, Voices has actually changed since I was there, so I won't take any uh, ownership over that. Um, but the, uh, I mean, the one thing CIR has is just we have, you know, resources that are dedicated to, to journalism. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of resources um, for, to, for doing a little bit of everything. So, um, um, but I don't know. We're working on a whole new redesign now, so. And the tech budget, is it mostly for the website or other elements to it? What else does the tech budget go to? Um, there's a, so there's like, you know, th that's a good point. You know, we have like internal IT, you know, IT people and all that kind of stuff, which at Voice we just had like an outside contractor who would come in and stuff like that. So a lot of that may be like once you're a bigger organization, you have more people in-house than you do um, contracting. Yeah. Or maybe we're, I don't know, maybe we just spend a lot. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we have a lot of discussions about ProPublica. Yeah. Um, no, the, uh, you know, the, I think the, the, actually, like, the thing that nobody ever tells you about grant writing is that it's not about grant writing. It's all about, like, politics and knowing people, um, which I think is really unfortunate, but that's sort of, like, the lay of the land. Like, I mean, from the Knight Foundation, we were trying to get at Voice, we were trying to get grants forever, and we couldn't get anybody to answer us. And then one board member said to them, hey, I met these guys. You should give them a grant. Boom, then we started getting grants. You know, and even, So it was nothing to do with our grant pitch. But um, so I think, so I guess the answer is, first and foremost, just try to make human relationships with people. And because what they have to do, and this, you know, this is the same with so many other kinds of businesses, they have to trust you, the individual, and then first, and then the idea is second, right? Um, and then after that, you just kind of have to differentiate yourself. I mean, I think what we would say is that we do a lot more innovation outside of the story. Like, we're, ProPublica does do a lot of the same, like, big re investigative reporting projects, but that we'll be playing around with, like, community theater and um, all, you know, all those kind of different things. biggest challenge? Ooh. That's a big question. Um, hmm. I think the, uh, I think like the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is, uh, I don't know if you saw like the, the launch around 538, around Nate Silver's uh, publication. Um, he had an interesting response to a lot of the criticism and he used it, he's a baseball stats guy, so he used a lot of baseball stuff, but he's like, we're just trying to, basically he said in so many words, we're just trying to hit singles right now instead of home runs, right? And that's what we're focused on. And um, everybody wants, everybody just wants home runs, right? Including when we go to baseball games. That's why baseball is kind of boring because there's not many home runs. Um, and, but and actually, if you're going to run like an organ, you know, run a website and a publication, you actually have to constantly hit singles because you need to have a community that's there when you do hit a home run, Right? And so you need to, I'll stop the baseball analogy now, but the, the biggest challenge I always ever had was finding a way to keep a website fresh and interesting every day, but still being able to do like the big long-term meaningful stories that actually matter to people. Um, and so that's a hell of a challenge that I don't think anybody's ever really solved. But what I ultimately decided on was just that 
I was trying to make reporters do both, like do constant blog posts, keep a blog, do Twitter, do all this, and do long-term investigative reporting. And my solution finally was just like, that's ridiculous. Like, just have very clear job descriptions for people. You either just try to keep a website fresh or you just try to do investigative reporting. Um, I think a lot of that is a legacy decision. Like CIR in its current form is a totally new operation, but it's actually been around since 1977. And so it's, it was a lot around a long time before there were web pages. And, and so they could only do journalism that way. And so they, their whole thing was just do stories and then find um, outlets. And I think that's just sort of slowly carried over. And that's something we're like trying to figure out how to how to keep those relationships because they matter, but actually try to be a lot more web first now. So we do suffer from like legacy problems. Yeah. Yeah. What are the biggest trends in the industry that you and your leadership team want to keep on top of and keep? Mm hmm. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think one of the things is uh, trying to figure out what metrics are meaningful. Like we have this ability now to measure everything. Like we know. Up to we can measure when people stopped reading a story. We know how long they read the story. We know where they came from. We know all. I mean, I, I was just in a meeting before I came here, and we get this spreadsheet once a week that is full of fucking excuse me numbers <laughs> that mean absolutely nothing. You know what I mean? It's just like it's gobbledygook. And we ask a bunch of questions of the data person, and she doesn't really know the answers to any of them. And so it's trying to figure out, like, it's actually trying to figure out what, not only, like, what that data means, but what is meaningful for us. So for every publication, it's different. For every organization, is different. And um, I think the new one right now that, that Medium is really um, pioneering is just the total time reading, um, which I think we're trying to piggyback on that. We have a lot of stories there on Medium. And that's a really big one. But just, you know, every, the, every few months it changes what the new trend is that you should care about. So I think that's a really hard one. Everything's really measurable, but we don't really know what means, what anything means. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, there was a, uh, the old rich people email. Can you tell us how the yeah. correspondence actually began with um, the old rich people? <laughs> the old rich people, yeah. Um, well, essentially, I had been a political reporter in San Diego, and so I had worked, uh, a really good friend of mine and I had worked together um, as reporters there, and then I moved, when I moved to Costa Rica, um, he stayed and was uh, doing great stories there, and so when they were, came time to start the publication, they reached out to him and said, hey, we want to hire you, and so he, um, this is kind of a long story, but his wife was in the Navy, he had to leave San Diego, and so he just said, you got to go find this guy. And so they, that's when they uh, found me, and then they hired me, and then we, as soon as his wife got done with being in the Navy, he came back, and then that's, we ran boys together. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the basis and okay. the CIR basis and merger? Sure. And the disappearance of the basis? Yeah. Is there any, do we have any background? For people here, okay. Okay, so the base citizen. Any, who here know? Does anybody here know what the base citizen was? Kind of. So it was sort of a. It was like a voice of San Diego, but for the Bay Area. Um, same kind of the same sort of thing. People saw like Chronicle um, cutting back on a lot of coverage. Put up money to start a nonprofit. Um, the uh, Bay Citizen went for a couple of years. I don't know exactly how long, um, but essentially. They uh, had a um, leadership crisis. The guy who put up all the money, um, Hel Warren Hellman, died. Um, and their CEO, I think, um, had, to, had to leave. And then, and then they had two editors leave just like that. And so what had started to become a really like, interesting, burgeoning publication all of a sudden was kind of rudderless and leaderless. And so there was basically a big merger between CIR and Bay Citizen. Um, which all kind of predated me, so I don't know a whole lot about it. But eventually, they just sort of phased out the base citizen name, and, and that's just become CIR now. So all the kinds of coverage, the, lo the local coverage of the base citizen was doing, and 
yeah. fairly well um, in different parts of the Bay Area. Yeah. It's, I wouldn't say it's totally gone. Like, um, I don't know if anybody saw, we did an investigation that came out last month on public housing in Richmond, and, uh, which kind of um, turned into a big story. But what, we'll do, what we're doing now is, I think, the long term, they were doing like daily, hourly uh, you know, publications. And what we've done is tried to take, is to take a step back because we, our idea is that people are kind of doing that and just do the bigger long term project. Yeah. And it seems to me like earlier it was a one-way conversation, and now it's become two-way because these sites users can give something back. Yeah. So this, what's given back by the users, uh, like what does the industry right now think about this? Is that of any value? Is that just something to leverage? What is what's going on about regarding that whole content that users generate? Yeah, I think that's a great. Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, I mean the. The, I think we're just starting to like understand the potential of, of crowdsourcing. I mean, there's been a lot of really individual, really cool individual experiments around it, but, n but still nobody has really tapped into it in any sort of large way to fuel like large reporting projects or fund or fuel how um, organizations even choose what they cover in a way that crowdfunding has, right? They're sort of like there still hasn't been a sort of um, Kickstarter, but not for money, but for like what a community should be covering. So I think what we're starting to do is you're starting to see a lot more of it not just being like dumped into the to the comment section, like hey, go comment. We want you to comment because like in, you know engagement doesn't equal comment section or Facebook likes or things like that. But um, but actually trying to figure it out in a way that's meaningful so that we're covering the stuff that people actually, that are valuable, that's valuable and interesting to people. Yeah, um, I would say that it has, it depends on the piece. Um, which is kind of what happens with experimentation, right? Like sometimes it's going to be really good and sometimes it's going to be uh, really bad. Um, I think, uh, and that's in also internally. You know, I mean, we've, we've done a few things that you can tell when they get screened just for like staff before it goes live that people are very uncomfortable with it. You know, because some of it is trying to take a little bit more of like a lighthearted approach to a serious topic and people think maybe we're making fun of it or something like that. But other things like there's a, we did an animation on the Bin Laden shooting that's like still to this day gets um, more viewership than anything on our YouTube channel. So um, I think it's like anything. Some of it's horrible and some of it's great. Well, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you.